My guest today is Mike Richter. Mike, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Uh, you and I work together, but uh, for the rest of the folks out there, tell us what you do. Uh, I am a partner solution architect in Microsoft's uh, global partner solutions team. I work with partners, helping them build applications uh, on Azure um, for software companies, helping them build their own applications and for uh, services partners, consulting companies, helping them uh, build solutions for their customers. And I've been can, doing this for, sorry. Yeah. I can tell you from experience, that's a fun job. It is a fun job. It is, uh, I'm very, I feel very grateful, honored to be able to do this job. And uh, I just, uh, I'm excited to wake up every day and come do it. Yeah. Uh, you're, um, the, uh, partners are building solutions, all kinds of solutions, but uh, one of the things I'm hearing a lot about is artificial intelligence, AI. Are we seeing some um, partners that are thinking about putting AI into their existing solutions or building new AI solutions for Azure? I mean, there are some partners. I think all the partners <laughs> are interested oh, okay. in that right yeah, now. Probably yeah, because it's so. got so much press. You, do, you can't... Uh, Look at the internet yeah. and television without hearing about OpenAI or ChatGPT or something like that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that is a huge um, um, opportunity for us, and it's something we're working with a lot of our partners on. And, you know, I would say a lot of those uh, engagements that we have with them uh, come in two steps, right? First is how do we... Um, what, what do we want to build, right? What's the capability we want to get out of AI? Um, and how do we do that? What models should we use and prompts we should write um, and the, uh, all the ethics and what privacy and all those things, right? Uh, and, then, and then once we have that, we kind of understand that. We have that nice and running in Postman or, you know, um, how do we then go to production with that, right? And make sure that it's secure, it's well architected. Uh, and that's where... Uh, I come in and the specific team of architects that we're a part of, that's where we come in to help partners figure that part out. Oh, yeah. So I guess, I mean, I think a re the reason why it's become so so popular right now isn't because things like uh, natural language processing, you know, just being able to interact with an application through English or some human language. Uh, that's become, the barriers to that are a lot lower now. There are APIs yeah. you can just call to make that happen. But some of these other things that you just mentioned, you know, just making sure that you're doing responsible AI, making sure that there's security built in, things that are, uh, a lot of these are not the functional requirements, but they're, they're really important. Right. No, yeah. Um, and I think, like you said, it's easy now, right? Open AI, a lot of these AI providers are making it easy to just call these APIs to get uh, generative um, AI out of them and to add to your application. But because it's so easy, uh, I think sometimes customers, partners um, don't do the extra work to make sure that they are doing it in a well-architected way, right? Um, oh, yeah, if you call the OpenAI API from your application, you can get the capabilities into your application. But is that really the best way? Is that the best way to do that over the long term when it comes to cost effectiveness and security and reliability um i don't think so right and so that's where we are helping partners think about how they get the long-term value out of uh these ai capabilities well, let's talk about some of those things here like uh, uh security for example that's a, that's a big one and some people save that to the end but i i think that's a mistake <laughs> Right. Well, um, uh, you should not keep that at the end. That should be kind of, uh, you know, and there, lots of security. folks do. <laughs> yeah. And I would say there, there's security at a lot, a lot of different layers that you'd have to think of, right? Um, because uh, first of all, you want to be able to tell, well, what what data is going to these models, right? Um, now with Azure, right, we have uh, OpenAI on Azure, which um, uh, the data that goes into uh, that model doesn't get used to train that model, right? Uh, so you can, and that, and that and that model that's used by you is not used by anybody else, right? So um, that's one of the benefits of using a model on Azure, right, for this. Um, 
but then but then um, once you have that model, you want to be able to secure, securely access it, right? Um, and uh, if you are familiar with Azure, as I know you are, David, right? There's managed identities, right? And you can connect to Azure OpenAI with a managed identity so that we never get in the uh, world of having to manage passwords, right? We can talk to um, Azure OpenAI. Um, our, our applications can talk to Azure OpenAI without having to manage keys and passwords and things like that. So that's kind of um, application level security. And then the last thing for security, I would say, is you know the networking security. And again, you know, you can lock down your Azure OpenAI to VNets so that it can only talk to. Uh, the resources you want to, it to talk to. So that's what's nice about um, Azure, and that's what a lot of our partners are, are choosing to use the Azure OpenAI piece of it because um, you get all these, I guess you call them enterprise uh, security features mm -hmm. um, as part of it. Uh, and you also mentioned uh, cost effective. Where does that come in in terms of AI applications? Well, th that's interesting. Uh, you know, one one um, scenario I was uh, playing with with OpenAI is being able to tell the uh, um, gender of a person's name, right? Like you get someone's name and you want OpenAI to tell you, is this a, a man or a woman, right? Um, and uh, that's OpenAI is great at doing that, right? but is that really the best cost-effective use of OpenAI. Because there are other third-party APIs out there that will do that, that are trained specifically on that. Or you can train your own model mm. on that, right? Um, so when you think about the cost of uh, the tokens for using OpenAI, you really want to think, you know, what am I asking OpenAI to do? Could I potentially use a different service, like an Azure Cognitive Service, instead of OpenAI, right? Which for now is, is kind of expensive, right? And if all you're doing is like a simple classifications with it, right? Um, you, uh, you may not want to, want to use it, or you may find that in your application, you are prompting, uh, your users are prompting OpenAI with the same thing over and over again, right? Um, Maybe you want to cache that information. Right, you may want to cache that information, right? Um, and then, and then, um, and you may want to use something like API management or some API gateway that would that can intelligently route the request um, uh, to the right service, right? So, okay. um, if it's if this looks like a classification request, route it to Cognitive Services. If it is really some looking for generative AI, then route it to the OpenAI model. And the last thing is, because we know we work with partners with software companies, you may want to have a tiering service, right? Where you use one of OpenAI's cheaper models for your free customers or your bronze customers, but your gold and platinum customers get the full OpenAI. So there's a lot to think about and, and you don't want to um, necessarily have to build all this complex logic in. That's where a service like Open, uh, sorry, like API management can help uh, do that routing, uh, um, help that make it easier for your application to do that routing. Um, yeah, that's one of the hard problems in computer science, because finding the right tool for the right. job, and right. uh, they, they just rattle off a bunch of tools that all do the same thing, but some are more expensive than others. Well, they they do the same thing. Some, or I should them, say, they're, yeah. all, they're all capable of solving a, a problem like like gender right. classification. Uh, the, right. Is... is the name Mike likely to be a man or, or a woman, you know. Just, <laughs> right. Easy, easy question for us to answer. Is the name Pat right. likely to be a man or a woman? Less, less, <laughs> less easy for right. humans to answer. <laughs> and then when you and then when you see that again, right, uh, you should cache that response, yeah. right, and not go back to the, the AI model. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, there are some ethical issues as well. And as you say that, I think of responsible AI, which is a big topic right now with a, getting a lot of discussion. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, I think that uh, I think we all know by now that AI is built on training lots of content that's out there, um, and of course that content has biases built in, right? Because uh, it's was written by humans uh, who are naturally biased, um, and uh, sometimes we're um, you know subconsciously biased, and um, we don't intend to be hurtful or exclusionary, but that can come out in uh, the way the AI model works. So just being aware of that. Um, 
when you are um, uh, using these models, right, and, and training them. So um, that there, we have whole teams at Microsoft that's focused on responsible AI and ethical AI, and and that's not my, you know, when it, that's not the main thing that I'm working on. I would say that again, that those that's the uh, the part one of exploring AI is is getting the value you want and. and and learning how to prompt and what models to choose and training models. Uh, I'm more focused on the, okay, right, let's operationalize your oh, AI capability now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's really not an architectural decision usually. It's, it's more of a, uh, right, uh, right. Uh, recognizing what the data, it's a, it's a garbage in, garbage out issue. You know, yeah. If you've got lots of biased data, then you're probably going to get a biased model, and therefore you're going to get biased output when you do this. So Exactly. Um, Anyway, uh, you mentioned well. You talked about security and cost effectiveness. Um, those are those are really two of the the pillars in the well architected framework. Is this right? Um, does the well architected framework uh, does it does it do we modify it at all? When we're talking about AI applications versus just other applications in general. No, I think all the pillars apply. Um, we just have to think about how do we apply them to AI specifically, right? So the cost effectiveness issue, right? Like I said, you want to think more about, oh, I'm going to use OpenAI as my tool for every AI problem in my application. You you want to now think, I actually have a lot of tools, right? Uh, I have cognitive services, there's third party, there's hugging face, right? I could train my own models. So, um, you know, one thing I've also seen is that a lot of times because uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI have captured the imagination of a lot of people, uh, a lot of the partners we work with want to use it now. That's their main tool. And, um, and, and to do things that I would say are more quantitative analysis, more classification or you know, regression analysis or predictions. And that is really uh, uh, more for machine learning, right? Uh, and, and, and that aspect of AI, right? Um, but uh, but it, it took ChatGPT to kind of inspire people, right? Sure. Um, and so they'll come to us and say, I want an open AI to tell us if we can approve a loan or not. And I'm like, well, you, you, you probably don't want to use a generative large language model for that. You probably want to train a machine learning model based on uh, data that you have uh, and on loans that you have approved or rejected to be able to then um, give you a competence score on whether to approve it or not. So, so um, yeah, that's... Uh, another, another example yeah. of using the right tool for the job. Right, right. Uh, I can type into ChatGPT. I can say, hey, I have somebody who has an income of... Uh, this much and this much in assets and has been employed for this long. Should I approve their loan? And it will give me an answer. <laughs> right. But it's probably not the best tool for doing that. Right. And, uh, and, and there's probably a lot of dimensions that go into that, right, to get the best answer, you know. Um, so. Um, I want. I'm looking at the uh, well architected framework page right now, and I, there's. Uh, I just want to just touch on some of these th other pillars that we didn't bring up, like reliability. Yeah. Like, how does that reply apply to an AI application? Well, when you're building, um, when you're taking dependency now on a, an API, like you were saying earlier before, that it's so easy now to build in these APIs. But uh, you, I should you say don't... easier, not easy. easier. Right. But if you're using these large language model APIs like uh, OpenAI um, or Azure OpenAI, you are not running the model locally. You're not standing it up. You're taking dependency on 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 their API, and I'm sure there are SLAs that come with that, right? Um, but uh, if it's down, you uh, uh, you are going to have an issue with that. Right. So one way, you know, uh, the most common way to do that is to have redundant you know, endpoints. And so you can do that, right? You can have multiple open AI um, endpoints in different Azure regions. Mm -hmm. um, and you can then uh, have uh, active, 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 passive, what, whatever makes sense for your business using API management or track manager or um, Azure front door. But that's something, another thing to think of, right? That um, it may get very addictive with your users, <laughs> right? To, to be using these, these features. And if it's down, um, uh, that will not be good, especially as, like I was saying before, more and more of 
these applications might come to uh, rely on open AI or, or generative AI as the main interface for the application. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's another pi uh, pillar we have to think about um, for production scenarios, right? Being able to have uh, uh, redundant uh, APIs that we can call in case there is an outage. Okay. What would you say is the biggest challenge in deploying uh, AI, an AI application, an application containing AI to the cloud? The biggest challenge, uh, I think, honestly, I think it's it's finding the right capability that uh, um, that you want to drive, right? Like the example I gave before, asking OpenAI to approve or reject loan applications, that's probably not the best use case, or there's better uh, technologies for that use case. So, so finding the right um, use case, then figuring out what is the ROI on that use case, right? Just adding AI is kind of cool, but um, it's expensive, right, to use these tools now. So coming up with the ROI, once you know those things, right, then I, I, I don't think it's too much of a challenge if you follow the Welcome Framework. Um, if, you know, you, you probably want your application, uh, th these new capabilities deployed in a way that's similar to the rest of your application, right? So if you're using Kubernetes, maybe you stand up another pod that is your microservice for talking to OpenAI, right? And um, if you're using um, Azure Functions, let's say, right, you create an Azure Functions around it, right? I would put a tool like API management in between your um, compute and the APIs because of uh, the resiliency factor. Also, you can inspect the uh, data going in and out, right? So with OpenAI on Azure, you don't actually get a log of the prompts that are going um, to OpenAI. You can get some metrics, you can get detailed diagnostic logs, you can get almost everything but the actual prompt text. Um, and so that's where using something like API management, you could capture all the prompts. And then you can kind of see do, do, how are people using this, right? Are they, and, and from that you can get insights about how you need to improve um, uh, the product, how you, you should be shaping the prompts. So, like I said, I, I don't think it's too difficult to go to production, um, but it's more about are we getting the value out of this that we expect? So, I think that's probably where the challenge is. Okay. Uh, is there yeah. anything on the topic we have not talked about that we should? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure, there's a ton <laughs> we haven't talked about. Um, I guess I, the, I would say the last pillar: operational excellence, right? Uh, we have I think with performance. It, those, yeah, those two we haven't covered here. Let's talk about operational yeah. excellence then. Yeah. Well, I was kind of getting into that with the uh, diagnostic settings, right? Yeah. And using API management to to uh, um, see that. Like you, again, this is not a service that you are. Um, uh, necessarily building if you're using the large language models, right? You're calling an API, you're not hosting it yourself. So uh, when it comes to operational excellence, it's more about are, are you um, using these tools effectively, right? Um, so it's kind of similar to um, cost optimization and resiliency. They're not, you know, there's a lot of overlap there, right? Um, and that's where um, uh, being able to um, have the low balancing between different APIs, the uh, um, so you so that's resilient, but also being able to um, make sure that you can automate that switching. Right, you don't want to say, okay, um, if uh, if if one region goes down, then now we're going to be down for an hour as we switch everyone over. Right, I think that's where you want to make sure that you have. Um, the operations as automated as possible. Uh, all right, and the last pillar is yeah. performance efficiency. You talked a little yeah. bit about caching, which I think is a piece of that, but oh, uh, yeah. we didn't really talk much about scalability, which I think is a big part of performance efficiency. 
Oh yeah. Um, and so with the Azure OpenAI service right now, there are some scale limits. Uh, I haven't memorized all of them, but that's something that we should be aware of and we should kind of figure out, well, what is the, what do we anticipate the traffic being um, uh, on these applications so that we can design accordingly. You um, uh, have some scale limits, I think at the regional level. So if you deploy four or five services uh, um, in the same region, they all share the same uh, scale ability limits. So you may need to deploy open AI APIs uh, in different Azure regions um, mm. to meet your um, scalability objectives. Um, caching um, can help solve that. And again, that's where also maybe um, offloading some of the requests intelligently to um, another Azure service like cognitive services for classification, right? Mm -hmm. um, or your own model for simple classification that is very domain specific. Um, all these things have to be think of, be, be thought of, right? Because if it's just throw everything at OpenAI, it's going to get super expensive, and uh, and um, uh, and then the performance you may have issues, right? Because you may have lots of smaller queries um, um, slowing down um, other queries, so. Yeah, it's just just a lot to think about, and that's there what we're helping our partners do. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot to think about. Now, now they could all yeah. just call Mike and ask this question, but Mike doesn't really scale that well. <laughs> what's uh, what's a what's a well, good way to go yeah. to learn to learn more? Where's a good place? We can go to the um, um, Azure documentation for Azure OpenAI, right? Yep. Um, obviously, there's a lot. There's OpenAI itself. Um, uh, and they have a great playground. We have very similar tools in Azure. Um, and, and for me, like I have uh, uh, played around with OpenAI directly um, to learn it. Um, but then for building applications, the, the APIs are basically the same, right? There's a small lag between what's available in OpenAI and then what gets to Azure OpenAI, but they're effectively the same. Um, uh, OpenAI runs in Azure, so does Azure OpenAI. <laughs> Right. Um, so I would go to the Azure documentation um, and just if you uh, now to get to get open AI, you have to fill out an application. Now, uh, it's not it's not just a service you could turn on. Even if you have Azure right now, you have to go through an application process, um, which it's gotten a lot better. It took me when I asked for it back in the winter, it took me like a month to get access. Yeah. Oh. Now I think it's a couple of days. Yeah, right. I, I asked for more recently than that, and it was uh, less than two days. Yeah. I don't know what so. it was today. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. This has yeah. been really educational. You have a great day. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. David, I really think that AI is a technology that we can, I hope, be friends with.